Richard Adler, a businessman turned a mentor, now with SCORE, which I'm sure is an acronym for something, Mr. Adler. <laughs> it is certainly an acronym. And no one uh, knows what it stands for. Nobody knows what it stands <laughs> for, and what it stands for can't be changed because it was a name created by Congress. Ah. And it's the Service Corps of Retired Executives. Oh, there we go. So well, it's that's much, today yeah. it's much more entrepreneurial oriented than executive oriented. A lot right. of our members are retired executives. A lot of them are working executives or mm -hmm. working people or business coaches. Or well, let's rewind in terms of your executive summary, your history uh, as, as an entrepreneur, as a business person. You have a very interesting uh, set of experiences, largely in the restaurant industry. Can you talk us through how that transpired in, in well, actually, my the, the majority of my experience is in the commercial real estate business uh, industry. Upon which restaurants were built. So I had it. <laughs> well, it, it's a funny story, but I'll get I'll tell you the, the story. Um, originally, I was in law school and was in law school during Vietnam, yeah. and I worked as an accountant. And this is back in Cleveland. This right? is back in yeah. Cleveland, Ohio, in the '60s, and. I couldn't understand why all these guys were in law school and they didn't want to practice law. They were mostly there to stay out of the war. Oh, I see. Right, right. And I was already a 4F, so I didn't have, and I had to, a child. So, and one so on for the those way. of us who don't understand what 4F means, that was... You're it. physically incapable of joining the Army. Okay, they, yeah. they refuse to have you because you're not qualified physically. Okay. So... Um, I was working as an accountant going to law school at night and when I graduated, right before I graduated law school, I got involved in commercial real estate and I really enjoyed it because as an accountant you really have to be an introvert, you're in, inside all the time and mm -hmm. going over books and I was not very good with details. but. Well, that's some, counsel <laughs> some counselor told me in high school that I should be an accountant. And in those days, you had to go to college to be something. And you'd listen to your counselor. <laughs> and I listened to my counselor. So I got a job in real estate, and then I was working for a company for a number of years. And I said one day to my wife, um, who wasn't yet my wife, I said, you know, I don't think I should be doing this for them anymore because I'm making a lot of money for them. And something's not right. I think I should go out on my own. So I had nothing other than confidence that I could do it. Yeah. And I went on my own. And, and one thing led to another. And after 25 years, I was working for one of the largest developers in Cleveland who also owned the Cleveland Indians wow. and 40 some shopping malls. And I was the person that did his office leasing for him. Um, if you ever watch TV, you'll see a uh, big key tower. It's like 60 stories. I leased that building right before I left. And the person that I worked with, for, with in his company left and started this restaurant company and asked me if I would invest in it. Okay. And I said, sure, I'll invest in it. And Invest said, your own money or uh, that of your it, employer? In, I didn't have an employer. I was. Oh, I, yeah, this I had, by okay. this point, yeah. I had a company with 14 employees. Got it. Okay. Um, but I also didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll invest, but I don't have any money. So that's okay. I have a banker friend that will lend, will lend me the money. So I said, fine. And I invested. And after about three months, he called me again. He said, and this was in 1990 or 91, the real estate market was at the bottom. Right. Um, he said, the operating partner, um, we found out, has a criminal record, <laughs> so we can't get liquor licenses for our restaurants. Oh dear. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, he said, will you become the operating partner? And Now you had not been in the restaurant business never, before. Okay. Never. 
I had been in the people business. Right. And the restaurant business, to some extent, is just, well, the restaurant business is every business. Sure. So, like a fool, I said, sure. And I closed my real estate business. I just gave it to the people that were there and went into this, mm. went into a, we had a franchise for Applebee's. And the reason he had the franchise is because his brother-in-law was the marketing person for Applebee's. So there's an existing relationship that could be leveraged. There was an existing there. relationship. Yeah. At the time, Applebee's had about 80 stores. Okay, so it. this is before it's big explosion. Oh, huge, yeah. huge. Yeah. Uh, way, way before. And we had territories, one of our territories was St. Louis, Missouri, and one was Portland, Oregon. Okay. And we lived in Cleveland, so I spent a lot of time on an airplane. And we started with one store in St. Louis, and we sold the company seven years later, and we had 22 stores. Pretty great. It was a lot of work. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of people, you know. What, do you, uh, what accounts for that drive, that, that willingness to give your real estate company to your employees and jump into unknown territory and then make a success of it, of it, of it as you have? Um, we did it together. It wasn't me. I think I like challenges and I get bored easily. Uh -huh. So, um, and the restaurant business was really a, fa a great business. And um, I liked the challenge of it. I liked the, there was a lot of real estate in it, finding the right location, mm -hmm. building the buildings. So Applebee's gave you basically a sign and a menu. <laughs> everything, else, everything else, and they took percentage of your sales. Everything else you had to do for yourself. Including, I would imagine, the uh, interior decor, that which usually had some sort of uh, local touchstones. Um, yes. Right? How, who sorts that? How did that... You know, well, there's, actu did there's actually a company that sends trucks out with, <laughs> with artifacts. Um, my partner's wife did the artifacts for our stores. Yeah. And the theory was Applebee's is a neighborhood bar and grill. It's your neighborhood so Applebee's. So yeah. in St. Louis, it became so successful that people would say, what's your Applebee's? Mm -hmm. Not like, have you heard of Applebee's? It's like, which one? Because they would only go to one. Right. Your, your own in your neighborhood. That's right. where you would go because all the high school pictures of all the football teams, the basketball teams, you know, they were all on the wall. And, and that's pretty granular stuff. I mean, somebody must be researching this to make sure it's accurate and, and reflective of the... Yes. Yeah. Yes. And not only that, she went to... We had artifacts. Our stores were some of the most successful stores at Applebee's. And the reason for that is, I mean, she went to Houston and bought spacesuits. And <laughs> oh, That's great. Seriously. Old, not in all of our stores, but yeah. in some of them. And they're very expensive. Imagine. But people would come to our stores and, you know, it's... it's they got an ambiance that they don't get in other Applebee's. Yeah, no, it's like going into somebody's attic, you know, attic or garage, you know, with, with all their, you know, ephemera and stuff around there. Yeah, this yeah. guy would come by with a semi mm -hmm. filled with this stuff or two, and she would go in there with other people and they would wade through it all and pick out what they thought was <laughs> good for that particular <laughs> store. So, That's great. You know. Well, in our next segment, let, let's talk about, uh, like, what you did after that, because that was that was a huge venture, and I'm very curious to know what the ne what the new steps were. Uh, and also, I want to talk about Congress and and Score and all <laughs> that. So we'll be right back with Richard Hadler. <laughs> We're back with Richard Adler. We've been talking about the impetus toward entrepreneurism and uh, his experience with Applebee's. Uh, was pretty phenomenal, having 22 stores and, and achieving. It was a great them. ride. Yeah. And we did it by hiring good people. Yeah. And then you got to California, and then you got bored. I got bored after a couple of years. Were you retired? Three or four. I was retired. Yeah. yeah. And, and people said, what did you not like? I said, well, I really didn't like waking up in the morning without a challenge, without any, I thrive on stress. Yeah. So I didn't have any, you know, yeah. I had Would the money in the bank and I. Yeah, you're actually sitting on a bed of nails to add extra stress to this moment so that you can exactly. have the challenge. Of, exactly. Yeah. So on one of my trips back home, I met a guy, he said, Richard, you know, you really should become a franchisee of Panera Bread. Mm -hmm. 
I said, well, really, we don't have any Panera Breads in California. What is Panera Bread? So he took me to one. And they were headquartered in, of all places, St. Louis, Missouri. There you go. And I knew them before they became Panera Bread because I spent so much time in St. Louis. They were called the St. Louis Bread Company. Interesting. So they, when they changed their brand, obviously they had a national vision well, in mind. Somebody bought them yeah. and changed the brand and um, wanted to expand. Yeah. So I inquired to them and said, hey, I'm living in California. I'd like to be a franchisee of Panera Bread. And they said, well, you can't be a, f we won't let any stores open until we have a, a dough, dough factory out in California. Interesting. So to make a long story short, I was the first, fr I opened the first Panera Bread in California in Palmdale. Okay. In 2002, I think, or 2003. Nice and hot down there. <laughs> nice and hot, yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, and had a different partner and um, wound up, we wound up opening five stores. And Panera wanted us to open more stores. And at this point in time, now this 2007, 2008, the real estate market is like through the roof right. and you couldn't make the numbers work. So this is pre-crash, right? This is pre-crash. Okay. Um, the last store that we opened, I think the rent was $5.50. A square foot? A square foot. Wow. A month. Amazing. And the stores are 6,000 feet. Right. So that's a lot of bagels. Yeah. Yeah. So they said open stores and we said no. Uh, and we said, hey, if you don't want us because we're not going to open stores, find somebody to buy us and we'll part friends, which is what happened. Um, so then it's now 2007 or the end of 2007, I'm bored. <laughs> and I remembered when I was in Cleveland, I knew a guy in the 70s or 80s who was involved in this organization called SCORE. So I said, you know, I, I investigated a lot of things. Do I want to be a consultant? Do I want to do this? I called SCORE right. and I talked to them and I joined. And that was in February of 2008. You joined to become a mentor. To I joined to become a mentor. Aspiring business people. Correct, which I still am. Why is, why is SCORE a congressional phenomena? Is this something they mandated? Uh, or, or a program that they underwrite in some way? Um, no, they don't. But it was created to be a faci facilitator along with a, an organization called SBDC, which is the Small Business Development Com Corporation. Okay. And they're both basically run by the SBA. Okay. So if you want to go... Small Business Administration. Small business, yeah. So if you want to get a loan, you go to the, um, the SBA doesn't make loans, they right. just insure them. Okay. So you'll go to your bank and say, I want to borrow X amount of dollars, I want to open this kind of company. And they'll say, well, that's fine, where's your business plan? Right. Well, I, I don't have a business plan, I have the money, I, I know the industry, I just want to open it. I have it. a menu and a sign. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, or you know, I have an idea. Yeah. And I know I can make it successful. And they said, fine, do a business plan, why don't you call SCORE? And they'll assist you to do a business plan. Because all you guys have had career, successful careers, and you can vet these ideas and help shape them and help organize them right. in a manner that it's meaningful to a lender or whomever. Correct. Yeah. Or not. Right. And then, I mean, I emphasize to the people that I work with and myself that um, you know, basically every company in the world started with an idea. Right. Um, a lot of them didn't work. So I say, encourage people, you know, make them find out for themselves if their idea is going to work. Mm -hmm. And you do that through a business plan and through financial projections and making assumptions and things like that. And so how do you feel about this trend uh, lately with, in the startup culture about uh, what, what they call the lean startup? I think Eric Ries wrote a book about that. And the idea is that you create a minimum viable product you make it, uh, you launch it such that there's a feed loop, but you, you are shipping it, you're always shipping, and there's a feed loop such that you understand what's happening to your product, how it's being received, and so you can iterate upon it and constantly pivot if need be. How do you feel about that approach versus what you guys do at SCORE? I'm not that familiar with that approach, but I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. One of the failings of SCORE, and I don't mean a failing, because everybody that belongs to it does it wholeheartedly, they love it, 
and they're invested in it. But if you look at the age of an average score mentor mm -hmm. and look at the age of an, a startup an entrepreneur, for the most part, there's a huge gap. Yeah, 40 year gulf, right? From a retiree age yeah. to uh, 20 somethings. Yeah, probably. I mean, yeah. Th our mentors probably range in age from, I would say, from 40 to 90. Fair enough. We have a guy who's who runs the administration end of our chapter who's 95 or 6. Wow. I, I would surmise, though, that the kind of advice you guys are able to impart defies what's trendy in, in business culture, right? When you were talking earlier about your experience uh, with uh, your ventures, you always had a partner. What is no, it that in the real estate business? I d initially, I didn't. Forgive me, but in the restaurant when I business, started in the restaurant business, I did, and eventually in the real estate business, I did. Yeah. yeah. What What qualifies somebody to be a good partner? What do you, What What should entrepreneurs look for in a partner, or should they? Well, I think what they should look for and what they usually look for are two different things. And I made the mistake. Entrepreneurs should find a partner if that's their um, what they're looking for uh, who has who brings to the table things that they don't have mm -hmm. who have different strengths most entrepreneurs want to get somebody just like them right. because then they'll be successful it and they might be but they'll be more successful if they get somebody more not like them but still has the same um, backbone and yeah. personality type I, I would imagine you start with an ass sort of a self assessment and you realize if you have certain deficits, uh, right, uh, that you may need a partner. Right. I, I think, think coming yeah. to the decision to have a partner at all is, is probably takes some self-interrogation. Uh, hey, there's a lot of people that don't have partners um, right. and are very successful, and there are other people. Um, I never felt comfortable by myself after uh, my company got to more than two people. I, I, yeah. I like you know, throwing things off of people and having two hits. Is that uh, because you're risk averse in some ways or because it helps uh, in terms of actual management? I wasn't risk averse. Uh, um, I think it helps yeah. in, in the management. And, you know, I, I, for instance, thought that I had strong people skills and um, I was comfortable talking with anybody, but I didn't really like the things that I was groomed to do, like the accounting right. <laughs> and the <laughs> detail stuff. You know, it's yeah. funny how that works. I would imagine that ideas are more attractive to you in pursuing and that kind of aspect. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm more I mean, of a big picture person. Indeed. Well, speaking of big pictures, we're with Richard Adler, and we'll come back in a moment to talk more about SCORE and entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship. Is that the word? Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll, be, we'll be right back. <laughs> And we're back with Richard Adler, uh, a businessman turned mentor with SCORE, and I've got all this literature now in front of me. <laughs> SCORE, SCORE is a really great resource, and I wanted you to kind of walk me through the process. So if I were an entrepreneur and I needed some advice about how to start, because it's, it is a sort of wide open world at that point. One, right? one of the best kept secrets in this country is SCORE. There's probably uh, 350 chapters, there's 11,000 score mentors around the country. Um, but yet, if you ask somebody what score is, they'll say, well, what's the game? And then I'll tell you the score. <laughs> it's a little branding issue. <laughs> yeah. It's, we're funded by Congress. Yeah. Um, and I believe our annual budget for those 350 chapters is something like $9 million. That's great. And you run it the North Bay chapter. It doesn't go very far. Really? Yeah, our, our <laughs> chapter probably gets like eight or nine thousand. Our chapter covers Sonoma, Napa, Lake, um, Humboldt, and Mendocino counties. It's pretty big territory, yeah. Yeah, it goes basically from Petaluma to Oregon. <laughs> and th but, but this is what y you oversee this entire endeavor. I have been for the last f four and a half years. Which is yes. great. So I'm an entrepreneur, I have an idea, yeah, I haven't crystallized it in a business plan. I call SCORE, what's the next step? The next step is for, since we don't have an office, mm -hmm. um, base, uh, some chapters do because they're larger than us and because of the ge geography of our territory, it's hard to have an office. 
and we can't afford a staff. Mm -hmm. So various mentors volunteer for services that, that we offer. So when we have what's called an assignment committee, when somebody inquires to score, uh, the person taking the assignments will try to figure out who geographically, skill-wise, um, industry-wise is a best fit for that particular candidate. We try the best we can, but basically a business plan is a business plan. It doesn't matter if you're opening a restaurant or if you're opening a manufacturing company, you're still gonna have to go through the, the basic steps of a business plan. And the reason you do a business plan is not just to have a plan, but it helps you understand what your business actually is. It's a lot of things. Okay. I like to think of it basically as a living document and something we, we Mentors are old enough to remember before there were GPS mm -hmm. um, systems. So you want to drive from here to New York, you're going to get a map. And you're going to, on your journey, you might decide, oh, I'm going to stop in Dallas. Then you get to r look at your map and redo it. And that's basically a business plan. I'm here today. Where do I want to be in three years, five years, whatever it is? Right. And I have to sit and figure out how I'm going to get there. And what we do is try to help them with, I mean, it's, everything is guesswork. Mm -hmm. So the more we can help them validate their assumptions, the better chance they have of being successful. Besides a business plan, what is it about entrepreneurs that make them successful, or at least help them? Is there a specific character trait or something that they have to have inside them that motivates them into success? I like to say that an entrepreneur needs three things to be successful and that's just my feeling and, and basically that is uh, an idea mm -hmm. a passion for that idea I mean really a passion so that all the time you're going to spend on it isn't work it's something you're doing a labor of love it's kind of like writing a book right um, and um, the so we have the idea the passion and the last thing is the ability to not let anybody tell you that you can't do it. Interesting. So a lot of people along the way are going to say, hey, you're crazy. Um, you can't do that. You know, um, I was talking to John earlier, telling him that um, I teach a basic workshop on should you start a business and if you do, what do you need to start a business? Right. And I give an example. And to the best of my knowledge, this is a true story. So back in the 60s, there was a guy who worked for Denny's or Hardee's or one of those companies, and he wanted to start a new hamburger chain. Okay. So he hired um, Gallup to do a poll, and I think they polled maybe 25,000 people. Okay. And Gallup came back and said, hey, you know, three out of four people don't like your product. I said, so I say to the class, what would you do? And they say, well, invariably, 90% say we, well, we wouldn't go ahead with it if 75% don't like it, but there's always one person in the class or two. Well, how big is the market? Right. Well, the market's 300 million people. So 25% of 300 million is substantial. 75 million, yeah. Right. And that's how he looked at it, because right. he was an entrepreneur, and he was Dave Thomas, <laughs> and he started Wendy's. Right. He was also a big gambler. I, I, and I think you have to be a big risk taker. You, you have to be able to bet on yourself and, and have the confidence beside the passion. Would you recommend that an entrepreneur go all in all at once on their new venture or keep their day job? Yeah. Um, most people in today's world, in today's economy, aren't able to, to do that. They have to keep their day job or they have to do something while they're working out the right. details of their new venture. I mean, most of my clients, or most of our clients have jobs right? or are involved in a profession where they spend time in it so that they can eat yeah. <laughs> and, and feed their families. So, um, you know, it's, uh, but I think as SCORE mentors, one of the things that we like to do is to always be positive mm -hmm. and never tell somebody they, they can't do something, even if we know there's no chance and that's often the case. But by supporting them and having them work on a business plan, um, they might come to the conclusion that, hey, this, this no way is this going to make sense. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because it seems it would be terrible advice <laughs> if, if you didn't help lead them to the conclusion that maybe their venture, that venture, is not the one that's going to work. 
and sometimes they don't they even if it doesn't make sense they're gonna if they're a real entrepreneur they're gonna find a way and make it work because right. they're not gonna listen to us yeah <laughs> Uh, any success stories you want to share? Uh, I'll, I'll give you two. That they were yeah. both in the paper recently um, in the Press Democrat. Um, I have, I had a client that I started out with about five or six years ago. A couple of ladies who, um, one of whom was a chef with the Gettys. Okay. Like a private chef. A private okay. chef. And they had a Montessori school in their house. Hmm. She's still a chef with the Gettys. And she would prepare food for the Montessori school students and they really loved the chicken dishes the organic chicken that she made yeah so they came to me she and her partner uh, and said we want to start a business and we went through a business plan um, to make a long story short by the time they were actually ready to go there were probably five or six score mentors that had worked with them and helped them so we really built a good team with them and now they're in Probably 250 Whole Foods. That's great. It's called Hip Chicks Farms. Of course, that's great. And um, it really makes you feel good to know that you were a part of it. Yeah. Even if you were just a part to gather the cast or or give yeah. them encouragement or something like that. What you a know. great story. Yeah, you really made it. And the other one is a local company called Karenko. Okay. They make uh, heavy equipment for grinding equipment for the restaurant industry. And they called us and they didn't they were between a rock and a hard place and they were on the verge of closing mm. and uh, after three or four years the same situation um, now they're looking for people that they can't find so wow. having success stories like that and there are a lot more like that that's great where how do we find how do we find score and uh, and connect with you guys and well um, we like to spread the word even though we're a very good secret we try to you know put brochures and things in chamber of commerces and banks but uh, north coast score no, north coast dot score dot org correct is our is place our to start yeah local website if you went on score dot org which is the national website and put in your zip code they would tell you to contact us that's great what a great place to start and 707-571-8342 if you just want to call directly do we ask for you is that correct no you just <laughs> they can but uh, whoever answers who it'll be an answering service that answers the yeah. phone they'll forward it to the person that will call them back that's great richard adler thank you so much for coming on come back well, sometime yeah thank you yeah, i'll be happy it. to yeah i enjoyed it very great. much what a great idea all right thank you in addition to mentoring services one of the primary things that we offer our workshops um, and they vary in uh, content from how to start a business to how to finance a business to how to make a marketing plan to how to do financial statements and they're really a good asset to people who are just in the startup phases or there are some that are really good for uh, existing companies and we publish a schedule they're online on our website <laughs>